you're someone that I don't know that well, but we've met on a few occasions. So full disclosure to people listening. Um, we work together for a fantastic charity called Mintridge Foundation. Uh, big up Joe, Alex and Katie. They were hey, Team Mintridge! <laughs> Um, okay. And that's kind of how I, I've, I've, I've obviously heard of you and knew you before Mintridge, but I never met you, never met you before. We never had. And so one of the things about you that I love so much is you are probably the epitome of the sort of person that I've decided in the last 18 months, I exclusively want to surround myself with, which is good vibes people, good energy people. Oh. people before, like you tolerate, but now I'm like, and, and that goes for family, friends. hundred yeah, percent. Work colleagues, um, 100%. if you're not good vibes, I don't care what you do. Just if you're not good energy, I don't want to be around you. And your energy is always on 100, always on 100. And I like that. We should hang out more. Even your dog agrees. Even your dog is agreeing that you are good vibes. Yeah. And I'm for that. And so the premise of this podcast is to try and speak to people who have worked in the three careers that I've had. So that's either DJing slash music, um, sports or media and journalism. And obviously you, you've got background in sports, which we'll get to very shortly, but combined with your good energy, I was like, nah, 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 nah. I've got to get Marilyn on the podcast, man. Cause A, I'm just curious to hear a lot about you that I don't know already, but also the, the little I do know about you, I want our listeners to kind of experience that. So rather than starting, Marilyn, at the start of your of your life, um, I wanna I wanna <laughs> I wanna kind of I wanna time hop a little bit. I wanna kick off with the question with what is it like being an Olympian? What is it like competing at an Olympic Games? That's super. What good to a me. question. <laughs> um, like I was actually what would my intern say? Deep in this the other day. I was actually thinking about this the other day um, because obviously I'm in a very reflective phase in my life, having retired last year and actually now almost just waking up from, I call it a fog because I, you know, I made the decision and I had about a window of four months when I just suddenly just fell into this depression thinking I'm such a failure and on paper and, you know, people that are from the outside, that made no sense. To me, that's just how I felt. And, it, you know, when it comes to things of the mind, what you think and feel dictates so much. So I'm thankfully in a phase where I am so proud of everything I've achieved um, and very reflective, looking back at what I achieved in spite of, but also because of my talent, my, my, my tenacity and my nature. And so I think being an Olympian, Ultimately, we always say once an Olympian, always an Olympian, because one of my pet peeves, which I'm sure you don't get wrong, because you're like broadcaster extraordinaire, is when people say ex-Olympian or former okay. Olympian. You are never a former Olympian. You are always an Olympian. Um, but you're only an Olympian once you actually step foot on the field of play, which a lot of people don't know. So, yeah, no, it's, it's an enormous sense of pride to achieve something that is the pinnacle of every sport, Olympic sport. Um, and so to have done it twice, um, albeit very contentious in the second time, um, and just been part of, you know, being part of history, um, it's, it's a phenomenal feeling. You feel superhuman at times because, you know, I realized what it took for my body to do the things it did to achieve getting a place on the team. It's not easy to be on the team, let alone come away with hardware, whatever color. Um, yeah, and you, I guess you're part of an elite club, which I didn't always appreciate or understand um, until sadly my latter days. <laughs> um, and mm. so that's something I really try and impress on athletes to really enjoy each moment. Because one, the one guarantee is that you're not going to do your sport forever. And you mm. don't know when your time is going to be up. Um, and I spent a lot of my career just trying to chase the next, chase the next. And I never really savored the moment enough. And so it wasn't until I was handed like a book and it was just pictures of all my championships I'd made. And one of my friends in the media, Stuart uh, and Christians in sport, he had put this together and got all the uh, photographers that would be trackside at every championship. Like he went all the way back to like, I think like Commonwealth Games 2006. <laughs> um, and I was flicking through this one day when I was really low and it just it just reminded me and all the memories come back and I'm very... Um, sensitive so like smells and things that I'd remember from each games I just came flooding back and then you remember like 
each trip and you know what it took to get there and sometimes I was like injured before trials but I still made the team um, and yeah to, to achieve two Olympic games just immense sense of pride and realizing that actually I did it a lot um, in spite of a lot basically. So this might sound a little bit weird but I, I, I don't want to focus actually too much on the the kind of out and out sporting achievements that you that you achieved um because people can look that up i'm sure you've done that interview a million times although i think it is important to mention that you did receive a respective retrospective bronze medal as part of the four by four meter relay squad um so i'm not going to ask you what it was like to win a, a, an olympic bronze what i am going to ask you though and what i'm more interested in is a journey to get there but what did it feel like to get a re retrospective medal? Because that delayed joy is obviously a different joy to crossing the line and knowing you've won a, do you know what I mean? A gold, silver, bronze. Did it feel like, did, did it not feel as, as powerful as it would have if you had won the bronze at the time? Or, or did, you, did it not kick in till later that, no, 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 we've, we've won this, but we've won it in a really, you know, bizarre and, and different kind of, kind of way? So which one do we want to talk about? One, two, or three? Two is the most <laughs> poignant. Two is the most poignant, which is the one we're going to pull out. The first time it was a, I don't remember. Okay, it was European indoors, bronze. Um, I was angry because actually it was a pivotal time, 2011. I remember not being at full fitness at that championship, but also knowing that I was actually good enough to medal. And the two um, Russian at that championships we just knew were unclean um and it was funny it's the first time that I really knew something but I knew nothing would be done and in the call room one of them was she'd literally just off the back of like running a super fast time she looked so nervous and I was like that's kind of guilt uh, and so yeah that that first one was annoying because that would have been like my first in individual medal and would have had a knock-on effect to getting my contract re-signed for the next season so on and so forth instead I was cut um, and then the second one was my Olympic bronze, which again, the year before that, we'd run a British record. We finished third out and out at the world championship. So we were literally ready to do the battle uh, with the Jamaicans. We just thought it was going to be between us and them. And then Russia and Belarus, Belarus, sorry. We were like, where did they come from? Um, so they both got banned because we actually finished fifth across the line. Both, all of us just looking shocked, but also knowing what it was, but not being able to say anything about it um, and at this point there was no one there was no retrospect of anything going on that was just what it was um and then oh, the who third... told you you couldn't say about it pardon who told you you couldn't say anything about it um it's not that we couldn't say we talked amongst ourselves but okay. where would you go and take it you know no one was really gonna because you know when you think about systemic doping it's it's this bigger hands at play so all the countries mm -hmm. are in on it the bigger federation sure. they're all in on it so Who's going to listen to us at the end of the day? Um, okay. That's just how we felt. Um, I mean, this is the era of no real athlete representation on boards, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the third time, it just got ridiculous. And um, I did go to the ceremony. I think with the Olympic medal and also the Barcelona bronze, they were both presented. You know, one was in Glasgow, but also with the Olympic bronze, we were presented at the Olympic Stadium. So for me, that brought up a lot of emotions because it was post-2012 which, you know, actually the Olympic Stadium in London has a lot of not great memories for me. Um, but I remember standing on the podium, which, which we wouldn't have had, um, the national anthem play, playing. I had my mum there, lots of family members. I just got everyone to come because, you know, they weren't going to come to Beijing. So I tried yeah. to be as positive as I could. And I just stood on the podium. And at the time, I hadn't yet decided to retire. This was 2018. And Chris Leo had come back, Nicola um, and Kelly Southerton, who I ran with, and they were all like very much retired and were firmly um, in their new career paths. And I just remember thinking, let me just try again. Like, you know, when I got to 28, 29, you know, your time is, is, is ticking. <laughs> and um, I was labeled as that athlete that just couldn't medal. Um, yeah, and I just was never gonna hit my potential. So I remember after 2012, just really abruptly having my funding cut. Um, and almost been forgotten about by my federation. However, in 2016, when this noise came and I was already in America, I heard through a friend WhatsApping me saying, oh my gosh, you're a medalist. And I thought she, it was Alex. I thought she was playing a joke on me. 
she uh, <laughs> she sent me this WhatsApp and she's like, hello, bronze medalist. And I was just like, Alex, what? I know she's like super positive. I, Alex <laughs> I thought she was like prophesying that, you know, keep training hard. And she's like, no, no, no. They've just announced it on Radio 5 Live. And I was like, oh. So then I messaged um, our then um, head of performance. And he's like, yeah, we haven't contacted you. I was like, you haven't contacted us, but you contacted the media. Um, they're like, no, the media just found out, but they're waiting for. So whenever um, a scandal breaks, they have to test the samples again. They have to give the other side a chance to appeal, all this stuff before they then confirm it. So yeah, 2016, I heard about it. Didn't really hear anything back, so I didn't really believe it. And then 2018, it was confirmed. Um, and then they had to give the medals back. And I was like, it's all great. Yeah, we've got this medal. But then I was like, think about everything that's lost. And I could talk about stolen moments. So okay, I kind of ran a roundabout way, plan B, in terms of being on the podium. That was great. But I lost funding. I lost so much confidence. You lose, you know, a bit of kind of, like I said, it tarnished kind of my reputation as being considered I couldn't meddle. Um, and, you know, I always was questioned with how I ran the 800, even being in the relay team, you know, you're the 800 meter runner, make sure you step up. And all I know is whenever I stepped on that track, I brought my a game a hundred thousand percent but then you don't have anything this is this is sport it's so fickle if you don't have anything to show for it often you know no one sees the journey to get there no one sees the bits underneath um so everyone's looking you know even when even just you know forgive them you know common public when they see you're an olympian have you got a gold medal that's the first thing they ask or have you been to the olympics you know, that's the secondary question so so many stolen moments but i chose to to use it as a platform because I knew this sport is fickle and now I can have that Olympic medalist title and that's you know whatever I can use and get out of that I was going to because that's what I deserved. I've heard Anthony Joshua say on multiple occasions that the belts don't he didn't want the belts to define him he wants what does he say don't, don't I'm not defined by the belts I'm defined by the type of man and boxer that I am so, which I think is, even if, let's assume he, he means that, but even if he's just saying that because it sounds good, it's a very kind of, I think, smart marketing ploy because what he's basically saying is, even if I'm not the world champion, I still think I'm the world champion. I'm still an amazing person, which I'm sure he is. Um, did, did you get some kind of validation by the delayed awarding of those medals? Did, did you feel as an athlete that to really be seen as a true world-class athlete i need something to show for me just to, to, to show for it or did you always believe that whether you win or lost you were very comfortable in knowing that you were a brilliant and a world-class sprinter very early in my career i had to i had i have a tagline that i say i'm more than medals um because i was constantly questioned i was constantly under scrutiny because i was so different so I run the 800 and the 400. And if we think about it, we don't have many combination athletes who choose those two combinations. I didn't choose them, they chose me. Um, and so I look different to or everyone I was racing at the time. Um, I wasn't Kelly Holmes, which was the closest to black we got at, the, at that time for the 800. Um, yeah, like, you know, we want to talk about the real, the colorism. It was my body type. Everything was came under scrutiny. So um, I learned very early that, you know, my running always had to do the talking. And so to have that kind of statement, you, I, I just knew that, yeah, I wanted to be known for my character and my integrity and what I brought to the 800 and to, you know, essentially pave the way for other black girls, you know, ethnic minorities that wanted to try this event because we're constantly told, oh, the bias was, you're just a sprinter. Okay, I'm going to sprint the 800 then. I was constantly told my style of running 800 was wrong, was wrong, was wrong. No one ever wanted to help me find out what was right about it. Even when I was, you know, UK number one, only person with the qualifying time in 2012. So for me, it was always just like, I was a bit of a maverick and I almost kind of relished that. And uh, as long as like my coach had my back and the people that mattered had my back, you know, that's kind of how I felt. So I think it's ironic that I sit on the board of directors now because I always thought I was like, you know, the outcast. 
I actually want to come back to that because I've got a question about you being on the board, which um, I'm going to come to. I just want to go back to, you said earlier on that London 2012 doesn't bring up the best memories for you. Just just tell us a little bit why that those games were, were, were just not the greatest period for you. Yeah, so 10 years on and, you know, I've had a few things that have taken me back there work-wise, um, did a recent interview. It's it's something that really it was a year that really should have should have probably made any British athlete, but actually a lot of a lot of us were left with a few you know scars, um, and so each year I try and like build on from that and learn the lessons. But the reality of it is the culture I was in, especially between two thousand and eight and twenty twelve, very toxic, and you know I always think you know things rot from the head. And our leadership wasn't the greatest, particularly our, our head coach. And there was just so much pressure to get to those games. It was a home games, you're, you know, because just having your friends and family that close, but then just the general public, they just feel like they know you. And athletics is suddenly on the map every Olympic. So uh, there was an incredible, immense pressure in the build up to it. And um, that definitely played into my performance. I, I feel like I can deliver at that level, but I'm someone that is, um, I really rely on you know, knowing that I have people that I can trust in my camp. And that was probably the loneliest year of my life. I feel like um, I was really just hung out to dry and left to deal with everything by myself. It's the first time I really had my eyes open to the politics of sport. Um, so just for those that aren't familiar, um, there's lots of stories floating out there. Mine has never changed. I was under a controversial non-selection for the 800, but I did go as part of the Rio Quartet. Um, but I do believe it was a personal vendetta by the, the, the coach. Um, and the fact that I was named in the team kind of meant that I couldn't really take, any, take it any further because I was still going. But I was you know, told by uh, co other coaches that I was being made an example of. So the reason why essentially someone could turn around and say, well, I didn't take out their hands because I had a bad trial. However, that was the first year where the Europeans and the Olympics fell in the same year. And just by all means, all measures, I wasn't allowed to go to the Europeans, which no one did a trial for that. That was just pure selection by the, the, um, the leadership and the, and the panels. I, had, I was the only person that had the qualifying time six times. Um, so I had all six of the top times. I was the only person that technically could have been selected if they went by the A standard, um, but they decided to go by the B standard uh, which meant they only took one person. Um, yeah, there was just so much that went into it and so much behind the scenes. But at the time, as athletes, we kind of, well, I know I do pride myself on extreme ownership. So I always just put it down to that bad race. But there were things that led up to that. Um, and ultimately, it came down to one person kind of instilling terror in that style of leadership. So I still went. I still, you know, I was there for my teammates. Um, and actually, I think London really stepped up as a, as, a, as a city. I was very proud to be a Londoner, but it was hard just never knowing that I was not going to step on the track. Um, had I not been to Beijing, I probably wouldn't be an Olympian because technically I hadn't stepped on the field of play. Um, and, you know, everyone's like, oh, but you got the kit, you got this. I was like, that's not what I do it for. <laughs> I wanted to go out there and perform and watching the girls qualify in such slow times for the early heats. Um, and I was in shape, you know, you have one bad performance. And so for me, I always think, you know, loads of people were just like, well, you should have done it on the day. That's fine. But our criteria is so subjective. You know, at the end of the day, I love the American system because everyone just knows where they're at. First three with the time goes. Whereas with us, you know, first two past the post and then there's this discretionary place that they save. Um, yeah, there's so much I could go into, but there was a lot and it, you know, it, it leaves with trauma. It does. And it, and it was really something that was a knee jerk reaction to me running away to the States. I don't need nobody anyway. So I took myself off to America. Um, I need to find more drama and stress, but, <laughs> but, you know, um, that's my nature. I'm going to by all, by all means, you know, and I just felt really abandoned by uh, British athletics. So kicked off funding. I had a letter through the post. Um, to say I was no longer deemed a medal contender. That was the funny line because then I got a medal, you know, 10 years later without <laughs> even stepping. Even though I did have medals, I did have medals. So that line was all didn't make sense. But yeah, um, 
I'm very much, you know, all or nothing. So that was me, packed my bags, moved over to America. <laughs> um let's let's go back marilyn um was you that annoying girl at school that was just far really really fast and not even fast through like training or practicing was you just that naturally quicker than everybody else i was gonna say i wasn't annoying but then when you <laughs> find it i was hell of annoying yes because you know what i hated training i was i just had so much natural talent i just i ate whatever <laughs> i was just yeah I, I oh my gosh I'll never forget because I went to a really lovely boarding school and yeah I just my coach would drag me out Friday after school why to run on the muddy lacrosse pitches and I only fell into running club because I loved lacrosse and it was a new game to me and you could just run everywhere and that was me I enjoyed netball and then my PE teacher was like you should go to a running club and I was like why I'm already fast and then I met my coach George and he was just he's he's like a dad so much more than just a coach he re he understood what I was going through in terms of home and he wanted to fill that gap he would come and pick me up he was based in Watford where school was he'd come to North London pick me up for training in the holidays take me to the track bring me back until I was old enough to get on the train uh, if I needed pocket money if I needed physio he'd take me George was it um, and so he just really you know ensured I stayed in the sport uh, and nurtured that talent, but he also instilled a lot of um, key messaging that I live by, and just you know, I pride my work ethic on a lot of the things he taught me, not just through our sessions, but through you know, you're traveling in the car with someone. I he had all the stories and all the lessons. Um, but yeah, I just I naturally loved sports. The only sport I didn't, I did not love it, but it wasn't my my best showing was swimming. Um, but that's, I would say, just because I started late, but my style was on point. So I tended to do the style races. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was a, I think it was a great outlet. Um, my Nigerian mom was like, what is running? Read your book. So, and our year group as well, we were just generally competitive. So we wanted to be good at everything. So fortunately, you know, we were often as, you know, brought as much excellence uh, to the classroom as we did in sports. But looking back i don't know why i didn't stick to tennis because you know we could have had the british serena over here <laughs> uh, is that what you're telling me yeah <laughs> british serena. listen whenever you're ready whenever you're ready <laughs> listen listen when i went to miami for the first time you know i had this is hilarious people were calling serena. me serena and i was like yes yes <laughs> listen that she's i never used to have like a role model and then she came on the scene and it was like i actually thought oh my gosh you're such an annoying younger sister to venus because i was like venus she's just quiet and humble and just wins great but then man just you can't deny serena's tenacity her sass her attitude Love. and just she's amazing <laughs> anyone that knows me knows that i'm the biggest serena fan it's, it's kind of weird and a bit a bit um, oh we might have to go toe to toe on that one uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> deep with me but um you just mentioned <laughs> your nigerian mum I and mean, we all hear about the the kind of the the the, the, you know, the african child that tries to do something in the creative field or the sporting field and the mm -hmm. mum that <laughs> you better go and be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer 100 percent. how did you how did you push through that then how did you did you lie about where you were going i'm going to the library when these times you're going to running club did did you did win her round how did you how did you get through that boarding school I was away for a lot of it um so that was really I call it my great escape um you know so on a real level growing up was pretty tough Stonebridge is uh it comes with its connotations and uh yeah growing up in Stonebridge in the 80s was tough I wasn't really allowed out so actually at 10 years old when I went to boarding school it's kind of it was a real eye-opener to everything that was out there because when I was at home you're not going out to play can't talk to the Jamos, can't talk to the Irish. And, you know, it, it wasn't, a, the streets was not where you, you needed to be as a young kid. But I always say those streets raised me, gave me a lot of smarts. Um, but yeah, my mum, she's a tough cookie and she put a lot of responsibility on me early and our relationship was, was quite difficult and still interesting to this day. I definitely learned a lot from her watching, maybe a lot of what not to do, she's gonna kill me. But when it came to this, I just had this feeling that I needed to pursue this. I got a lot of confidence from George and just seeing someone invest in me so much. 
um, just made me wanted to see it through. But I always kind of in my head and probably right through my career, just always questioned whether it would be a career. Um, just because I just have ringing in my ears. I didn't send you to school to run, read your book, read your book. Um, she wanted a lawyer, she wanted a doctor. Um, and I understand uh, in terms of her sacrifice and everything she'd done to be in this country. Um, but, you know, and I always talk to my mentee's parents when they always ask me about this subject. Support is all they need in whatever it is they're gonna do. I actually really enjoyed school. Um, and really enjoy learning and maybe if I didn't have so much um, pressure from her I might have gone on to be a lawyer I'm very much an advocate in many spaces but I just wish I had a bit of a blessing with this and it was like everyone else saw how talented I was and I think a lot of my struggle with affirmation starts there because so many people can like say well done well done well done and I and then often it's just like I need that affirmation from that one person it stems from my mum just never being satisfied um, and that I think a lot of people that strive for you know these crazy fates in life and high successes you have that perfectionist trait and I had to really check that very early because it was veering on a very unhealthy path especially in the world of sport and pushing yourself I, I didn't get it right I can't actually can't sit here and say I, I got it right but I know a lot of it was from that early lack of affirmation lack of support um, and I felt very lonely in my career which sport generally can be a lonely career but especially so much in terms of when I was going up against giants like performance um, managers and the federation I never felt like I really had anyone in my corner you know when you go to competitions I had some great friends who would come and watch me but like in terms of like your family, you know, when I see other people and their family are just at every trap meet with a picnic or whatever, um, I never had that. But yeah, sometimes you just have to just focus on what you do have. And I had some some great friends who stood in, and family is is, is what you make it as well. And what does it say? You know, we've seen so many in, in acting and TV and film. It's probably the best example of seeing British talent, black British talent, having to go to the States to really smash it and have their talents fulfilled and, and realised. What does it say about sport in this country that you ha you felt that, you know, you, you needed to and wanted to move to the States to really... I don't know if it was to try something different or if there was something that you knew was there that was conducive to your personality and character and talents. What does that say about, about the British athletics set up back then at least? Hmm. I think for me, I was always chasing a mindset, which I feel like I really, I get out there. One of the things in, 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 in America, track and field is not anywhere near the number one sport. And um, we've just had a world championships in Oregon and hmm. I can I can count so many world records that have gone to that US team. It the competition is so fierce. So and it's you know it's every man for themselves. So it's about mindset. Everyone trains hard. You know everyone has access to a track. Accessibility to good facilities out there is is not an issue. Um, so what's going to separate you from you know the best and the rest? And it's that mindset. And I just loved it when I got out there because everyone's got the kind of mentality of fear no one but respect everyone because you know we all work out in hard in these streets um but also just the investment you know they really invest in developing their athletes so that ncaa system is no joke um, and i think it's a nice taste of what the pro circuit could and should be um and i say that loosely because i feel like in the uk it's really not professional but out in the states they really understand that you know, to be a full-time athlete, what it's going to take. And I think, you know, the money that's thrown at it echoes that. And you can be a collegiate athlete, you know, graduating, coming out of the NCAAs and be on a proper contract, which, you know, I think we see a quarter of that on our professional contracts over here. Um, so, yeah, I think they really get it right. I think for me, going to America, I was, I was years late. I should have really probably gone out. I don't, I mean, you can say you could regret things. I did have a great you know time at University of Bath but I think if I was really on it and if it was something that was as popular when I was at uni I probably should have gone out to a US college um, so yeah I think it was just something that I just didn't have the courage to do when I was younger so I went out and 
worked and lived vicariously through the girls I was coaching, <laughs> which was mm. fun. But I could really see above everything else the mindset because you know talent isn't isn't fair it's not distributed fairly <laughs> so what enough. I what I saw was a lot of like you know not necessarily naturally talented the most gifted naturally talented athletes but they had that mindset and I really believe in the power of champion mindset um, and that hard work that will do outdo talent that doesn't want to work hard and with the right environment without the right um, support network investment they would go on maybe they're not going to be olympians but they were going to get to usa's and pretty much usa's is like second to the olympics if you've ever seen the usa's um mm. but it's incredible to see what the right environment coupled with hard work and mindset can do and i really sort of lived that day after day when i was out in the states i just want to before we get back to sport i want to just jump back to one final thing regarding your your schooling what why boarding school why was that something that your that your mum wanted that you know why, why was that something that why was that something your was important to your mum to be in that particular type of school so it was actually important to my dad um okay. who was the one who had the idea to send me um I always say send because that's just what everyone's like, oh you got shipped to boarding school um and it was actually such a blessing um I think it's just it literally was that blessing in my life that changed the whole trajectory my dad um has always been in the states um I don't I'm just building my relationship with him now I would say um and he's always been a distant kind of figure down the phone um but he always you know would send things to look after me money I guess um and he also knew that life was pretty tough for myself so I think he just wanted to give me all that he could and the best opportunity to to find what it was that I was passionate about what it was I loved and I, I think he knew that I would find that at boarding school so he um he just told my mum to find a good school and I remember just looking through lots of different videos VCRs then of different schools so I handpicked this one because it seemed the most homely and home is something super sensitive and important to me because that's one thing that's never been stable um and you know I'm still like almost getting there now now I'm back in London but yeah it's a sensitive subject and I think Abbots Hill just was my first sense of home and stability uh and a lot and you know someone can really thrive when you've got that that incredible environment around you so yeah that is definitely one thing that I'm always thankful to my dad for and when I do get to see him again that's you know always going to be the, the first thing that flies out of my mouth just the most incredible opportunity um and it put me literally in a world away from what I knew for the first 10 years of my life so um forever grateful <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated to hear about about your upbringing um you, you spent some time in care is that is that correct yeah I'm saying that like it's actually my foster family were amazing so um it's not hard for me to talk about I don't really talk about why I was in care but um yeah at seven for two and a half years I spent in um foster care and I was placed with a wonderful Asian family um and it was the first time I lived with a man in the home so I was particularly close to my foster father god rest his soul he's died now um and actually i found my foster mum really a little bit scary but i don't know if that was kind of connotations because i always found my mum a bit scary but i loved it. it was the first time i kind of had that family dynamic i lived on a house um with like a you know a really pretty much a safe road it was an alperton and we used to play out stuff that i didn't do on the block in stonebridge <laughs> <laughs> So um, actually then I was coming from Chalk Hill, which was even worse and doesn't exist anymore. It's like the big Asda in Elfes at Wembley Town Hall. But that was a notorious um, estate. So yeah, it was, um, it's funny because like I have like random memories. I think when you experience trauma, you block things out. But this like staying those two and a half years are definitely years that I remember very fondly. Um, I'm pretty sure when social services asked if I wanted to go back to live my mum I said no <laughs> but um yeah they obviously didn't listen to me um but yeah it was it was it was a happy time I remember my foster dad teaching me how to ride a bike um he worked in the Heinz factory so he always come back with loads of Heinz products which is why I'm just like 
very like bougie with my hands I've got behind. <laughs> <laughs> it behinds everything uh, because I used to get it free um but yeah just the community spirit of I remember Cromwell Road that's where I that's where I spent those years and yeah I used to walk to school and you'd pick your friend up on the way um my foster brother and foster sister Junior and Jillian I remember them so well I remember when Junior was going to be taking us to school this girl used to sneak over in the morning and <laughs> meet him I'm like I'm telling mom <laughs> and then he'd buy me some sweets so I just had like a bit of like just kind of family vibes which I think you know I grew up quite lonely and I had a lot of responsibility very early so that kind of yeah it was just happy times and how did you navigate you said you went from uh Stonebridge to, to a town near Watford or was it actually Watford to go to for boarding school yeah so it was King's Langley which is King's Langley. just outside Watford um and i'm guessing that's very different from stonebridge so that listen. young age how, how <laughs> did you know the two do you know what i mean those two worlds so um yeah i literally i realized there's a term that someone mentioned recently on a talk called code switching and i was i think i have a phd in that because listen when i was driving up that drive i was like yes <laughs> this is my new playground um yeah so bunkers lane is notorious it's a beautiful long road up to the school and my second boarding school is even crazier it's stove school where richard branson went um okay. but it's so green just seeing like it's very peaceful so um and i think when you grow up in a lot of chaos you know your mind is very cluttered so i remember it just i just had this overwhelming sense of calm and then you drive into um, like there's a massive like house, um, which was basically the boarding house at the time. It's now a day school. And I just remember being blown away and thinking, wow, I'm going to live here. And I could just reinvent myself, I guess, um, which I did for the first few years because no one was going to no, know. They didn't know what they know about Stonebridge. I'll never forget. Always tease her to this day. One of my closest friends. And we were all kind of talking about where we lived in London because to them, London was Kings Road and Chelsea and Richmond. So one day they were like, oh, where, where do you live again, Maz? You're in London. And I was like, yeah, Stonebridge Estate. I was like, I'm proud. What? <laughs> <laughs> and the girl <laughs> turned around and said, oh, my goodness, how many acres? <laughs> I was <laughs> like, do you mean how many uh, flights of stairs do I have to go up? Um, because, because Mary, you know what? If you, for someone that doesn't know where Stonebridge is, it that fantastic. could sound like a very posh place. <laughs> I, in fact, it wasn't Stonebridge. I said, I said Stonebridge Park. So yes, oh, okay. That's, I that sounds bougie. Her. That I forgive sounds her. Bougie. I was like, it is bougie. There is a nice park there that you can go and smoke weed in. <laughs> um, um, so yeah we always laugh about that but it's crazy because obviously now it's right you know it's right next to Wembley Wembley has completely changed um, and is yeah, I can't even afford to buy a flat there right now um, but yeah I, I had to adapt but I when you grow up with a lot of dysfunction and constantly moving it's it's part of you know it's part I guess it's my superpower I'm able to just adapt very quickly um, and I and I kind of got used to making home wherever I was for that time, which is great for sport because that's kind of how your life ends up. But you know, like as the longer it goes on, you know, the more I just crave stability and calm and um, just a place to call home. So that's forever like my pursuit. But in the meantime, I got used to just making wherever I was for however long um, home. Abbots Hill was a great place to land. Um, I spent five very happy years there. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't even want to go home when it was holidays or exit. <laughs> so I would even go to friends' houses. Um, and obviously the leave weekends, I just stayed. I was a full-time boarder. Um, and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Got fully immersed in, in everything we did in the culture. And I was learning all the time um, from other people. And I think one of the things was I never got made to feel like any less than anyone else. Um, I think that there was a bit of an, a nice innocence then. I'm not sure how I would cope at school now because <laughs> I'm such an advocate for, for justice and being fair, but um, see the rule of life, life's not fair. But yeah, even though I was around really rich kids, they were 
very humble. I don't think they really knew. They were, you know, very aware that their parents were rich and, you know, they always extend. I love like <laughs> when you go to school with rich kids, they're always spending their mum's parents' money anyhow. <laughs> and they're like, do you want something too? Do you want some new trainers? My mum will get me. <laughs> and the mum's like, okay then. Um, but I had one really close friend who lived in Richmond. And so that was quite close to Wembley. And I would always just go and stay at hers on the weekends and her she was half Egyptian half English I remember thinking I'm gonna buy one of these houses one day because they lived right on um opposite Kew Gardens having no clue like you know how notorious Richmond well, is she was in. yeah I was just like when I grow up I'm buying a house right here <laughs> and it's still yeah, a dream yeah. of mine you know why not um yeah so yeah it it, it was a welcoming environment it wasn't till I got to sport I really started to feel um, any kind of in terms of you know my skin color or anything like that I think at Abbott's I was just every girl was just encouraged to be themselves uh, and to explore and just discover who they were well that that leads to the next question then because going back to the sport I've seen some articles that you've that you've been in um and things that in quotes that you've said about colorism I want to talk about but more so body type and the black mm. women um, a, a lot of my um black women friends and cousins often uh, for years have been you know I've seen it spoken about how their bodies are objectified and their body type um is often used as a reason why they can't do said job or they can't be a said thing whatever it may be just talk to me a little bit about how your body type you mentioned Serena Williams earlier on she's probably the biggest example of a black woman with a particular body type who's despite people use trying to use her body as a reason why she can't be good at tennis actually a big part of the reason why in my opinion she is good at tennis um but just talk to me through your experiences when you were an athlete of what you had to deal with and the things that were said to you about your particular body type I love that you um, mentioned that about Serena just then. So literally the call I was on just before this, we've got, um, this is um, an inclusion week at work where we just have all these courageous conversations. So we've got an uh, employee network called Black Connect that I sit on the committee for and I'm on there as an athlete, but also a black female athlete in sport with one of my uh, fellow athletes that have joined the business in Brazil. And this is you know exactly what we get into, body image, body confidence, um, funnily enough, when I was called Serena in Miami, I was gassed for us because I was just thinking of, you know, I, I love her to bits because she's the first time I saw someone embrace and just love the skin she's in, love her muscles and just run with it. She received negative comments and she would just flip that right back around because it was just bouncing straight off her. And I took a lot of my confidence from her to just own and you know and I was always I'm Niger Nigerian we're very proud very proud of everything that makes us us so like I said no one made me feel uncomfortable at Albert Hill it wasn't until I got to the world of sport and they started trying to package me in all these boxes I didn't fit in oh you're too big your muscles are too big I was even too heavy boned I was like please is that even a thing but what I realized is I had I had white men policing my body so there's a whole lot we can unpack there but also like these were all just biases like everyone just assumed I will ask 10 people what event I do nine of them what will say 100 meters 200 meters so there's just this immediate bias that we assume with muscles um and I'm Evo tribe we are very very mesomorph that is like you know we just crush stones with our teeth that's a little joke we would say um so in terms of definition it's all there and genetically just incredible species but it was very hard to embrace that and understand it because of how other people made me feel um so if I just start with the sporting realm just yeah 800 meters typically I look like no one else on that start line all the studies in general, it's hard one to find enough data on women, let alone black women. So, you know, I'd be doing all these VO2 tests and they're like, oh, scratching their heads. Well, you know, your results show 
this, that it should equal this, but you've run this. And I'm just like, that's because nobody like me. <laughs> we haven't had anyone like me in the UK. And that's a big factor why I went to the States as well, because I felt like I could just authentically be me and no one's going to question why I did the 800 and why I ran like that. Um, I felt no one was courageous enough to step out and say, okay, what is that? What is it that makes Marilyn so good? Well, that's, what is it that makes her the 800 meter beast that she is? Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I loved Serena because she just didn't care. And, and I adopted that as well. I was like, at the end of the day, my running is going to do the talking and my performance is going to do the talking. Um, very vocal about an incident I had with a coach who called me heavy boned and had all this stuff to say, even most recently, still talking about my uterus. Like, I just don't understand where that is relevant to my performance or why you have the right or why you think that's your business. It really isn't. Um, and then there's like the other side, like the social side and society. Um, I think there's a, a bit of a shift to, I feel like I'm seeing people trying to work really hard for something that came so naturally to me. And so that's one thing I always reminded myself, people like either pay or want to work really hard for what is naturally yours. So embrace your body and love it. And I really do like, obviously I'm in a transition phase again, my body is changing for life post sport and, and it's, preparing myself for what life post sport might hold you know like having children and so my body shape will change and my hormones will be different but you know I think I my arms were definitely a, an issue of contention when I was growing up my lips I talk about my lips a lot as well because I love my bold lip and lipsticks but when I was at school hell to the no but now people are making where you know paying money for my lips uh, my arms they were just so always so massive but there was a time where I just everywhere I went women were stopping me and saying oh my god I wish I could have your arms I wish I could have your arms and I'm just like people wish they could have my arms and I don't enjoy them listen God made me the way I am um, and especially mm. the more I started to perform well and realize okay this is the body I need to achieve the things I need to achieve so I've only got one I need to just be proud love it and cherish it and you know that acceptance really you know set something off inside me and I think it kind of I just embraced it and ran with it and you know at the end of the day if you don't like yourself then why should anyone else you know um, and it's a very bold statement and I definitely had to learn and go on that journey I think everyone has to go on that journey but I am you know aesthetically very happy with myself I can't change it um, you can definitely enhance it but ultimately there's only one you like that you know so I, I just embrace myself and, and love it. Obviously dating as well. It can be a bit contentious when you've got bigger biceps than, you know, guys you're going on dates with. That can cause a little bit of intimidation, but uh, they'll get over it <laughs> if it's the right person. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, but I, you know, what I realized, a lot of things I was worried about were like other people's opinions. And I ain't got time for that. I'm just still figuring out what mine are. So um, yeah, I, I truly, I did a wonderful um campaign to help launch Cantu Beauty skincare range and we had to talk about our, our um skin love story and it was so fun we had Judy Love on there and some other black creatives in the industry and just all talking about you know how rich our skin was and what we loved about you know our skin color and you know for me being a black woman just embodies so much strength and so much grace and I love that I'm going to wrap in a second with a final question just about Marilyn now and going forward and, and, and kind of post retiring what you're doing now and, and what you, what your mission, what your goal, what your objectives are now. But what, just before I ask that question, I mean, I, I'm not the, the kind of phrase that we hear a lot of the last few years anyway, is you, you got to see it to believe it. I used to kind of really push that mantra quite a lot. I don't know if I believe that anymore. And I tell you why, because representation in all areas of life i think is important but as we're seeing with our current government and we're just off the well, we're coming to the end of a conservative leadership race where it was the most diversely contested um leadership of all time <laughs> with you know these british asians da, 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 da. Oh i'm doing it tomorrow at the point of at the point of recording this interview the women's euros are taking place and tomorrow i'm interviewing um uh the one of the the, the chairs of the england women's team and one of the questions i'm going to ask her is because it's about the lack of diversity in the england women's team i'm going to ask her about the lack of diversity at board level she will say to yeah. me no we, we we have him and her and they're black mm, token. I don't, I don't, 
Well, I don't want to kind of get into the whole wrong and right type of black because yeah. that's a dangerous thing to go down and I've, I've got my thoughts on that. But you mentioned earlier on that you're on the board or you're on a, you're on a couple of boards related to athletics. So I wanted to find out from you, do you still think that it's imperative to kind of tell people that representation matters um, and having black people on boards, whether it's in sport or beyond, is essential? Or do you feel that, like I do, I don't know if I believe that anymore, or if I do, it's a bit more nuanced than just having a black person in the Conservative Party or having a black person on this particular board. It goes it goes deeper than that. And, and what are you doing on the board to ensure that you keep your voice and you stay true to what it is you need to do, even if other people around you aren't, aren't sharing your vision and your 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 reasoning for being there? Yeah, wow. So, so great. I'm so glad you brought this up. So for me, it was important that um, I really studied governance. I think there was something in me that knew I really needed to use these experiences because some of the experiences I've been through, I don't want anyone to have to go through that. Just, I just think there was a lot of pointless trauma, like it could have been avoided. Had there been someone who could relate to me had there been someone that can say let's do this this way because you know this is what's going on and and I think only someone that can truly see you for your color for your culture and understand and sometimes it doesn't take vocalizing things for someone to understand and I and I and I've seen this through mentors that have come through for me since you know especially like in the latter parts of my career where it was just really really difficult so my motivation for getting on the board was one I do believe representation matters but having that lens and that perspective and someone that can speak up from that place a lot of the things I'm bringing to the board because I was just observing for a long while I, it, I, to me it's not rocket science but to them it's like I'm bringing gold dust because they've just never heard anyone say this and I'm like wow so that's the power of having you know that representation there However, it's got to be so, the right person with the right skill agree. sets that's going to add to what's already there. Um, I agree. Sorry, just, just to listeners, just to let, let everybody know what board you're, 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 you're referring to. Okay, so I'm a non-exec director for UK Athletics. Um, I'm also a trustee for the Wembley Stadium National Trust, um, which is it's, it's quite a fun, feel-good committee to be on because we give out grants to you know local community efforts and yeah, I love that I'm a Brent girl, so um, I'm really passionate about finding new causes to support as well as, you know, supporting long-term projects that are going on in the community, um, particularly pertaining to sports. Um, and how much how much impact are you having, Marilyn? Because I, I know a whole lot of people on boards and they get to have their say, and I know this is the, this is what the white people like to do. They like to invite <laughs> us to the party, but we can't make an order. We can't we can't reset the yeah. the knives and forks. We can't do anything. It's just oh, no, no. We've got representation. We've got we got we got Marilyn, and we got we got Jordan, and we got we got Leroy, and we've got Ola, and they're on the board, but mm. no one's actually having an impact and, and 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 a say that tangibly changes things. Do you feel that you? your voice, your experiences are not only respected, but actually in some cases implemented. So here's the thing with me. I don't have time to just, just be filling a seat for no reason. So I was very intentional with the applications that I put on. But before that, I did my effective board member co course, which is run by um, Carl George, who's just like a governance king. Um, and he does um, a course for the PFA. So just getting on that course gave me so much insight and the importance of the roles that I was going to apply for. One, predominantly paid roles, because I feel like that's what I'm worth. My time is worth something. I do 100%. have a lot that I, you know, naturally want to support, but actually those roles, I knew they were going to, like you say, not just have me there and not listen to me. And so Particularly with UK Athletics, that was a big one that I really wanted because of the experiences I've faced, but also the culture right now. It needs, I feel like I can say this boldly, it needs a me, someone that is not afraid to speak up. Um, you know, they can't do, like, nothing else can happen to me. They, the worst happened to me. So if I can change the trajectory by having an impact and having a seat at that table, 
that changed my whole look on retirement. It gave me that fuel, that purpose, that drive again. Um, so I was appointed there in um, February of this year. And just to wrap, Ma- Marilyn now, post post um, athlete, who is Marilyn now? What is Marilyn trying to achieve now? And what are you up to? Wow. <laughs> what is Marilyn? Marilyn is a very, very busy girl as usual but I'm, I'm very happy with what I'm busy doing I spent a lot of months last year very low very dejected wondering what life would look like on the other side I just wish I had prepared for this a little bit earlier and got to this place a little bit quicker but the lessons you know uh, so currently my day job I am a new to career program lead for a data company called Equinix um, so I drive a lot of our internships and early career um, job roles, essentially recruiting new, new early talent, um, diverse talent, currently in full swing with the internship program. My primary goal was to bring in diverse talent to the company. Um, they really champion it. It's a new function to, to the business. So there's a lot of educating and helping them understand um, twofold, really, the importance of attitude, aptitude and potential. Um, but I myself was a new to career hire coming from a different pathway. So we have a few pathways So the athlete career transition pathway, which I also take a lot of ownership on and bringing in uh, lots of athletes to follow, follow suit, uh, because we do have some incredible transferable skills and not just the generic one, you know, hardworking, uh, dedicated resilience. There are some real things I'm realizing, right, I can handle this pressure because (laughs) my whole career before was pressure. Um, I can just get up and talk in front of anyone because I had the BBC do that to me after every race. Um, (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's fun. I was scared as anything when I was offered the role and I just thought, what am I going to do in a data company? (laughs) But I'm learning. I am meeting so many different executives and leaders. And it's just nice to be recognized um, to facilitate, you know, beyond my role in new to career and really get involved in some of our uh, DIB initiatives. Um, I think the culture was exactly where I needed to be. I think having been beat up and spat out by the sports world it was great to come into a company that is committed to um i think they're excellent there's a real man we talk about the magic of equinix they're not perfect which they own but the culture was one of you know we're going to work with you we're going to be patient we're going to build you up um here there's, there's there's so much opportunity here um my first few months just interviewing um not interviewing but having like meetings with different hiring managers to discuss their intern hires I was just sussing out, okay, where do I want to go next? Do I want to go to this team or that team? Um, yeah. But one of the things that stuck out to me was a lot of employees had been there for a long time. And when you come out of a, a career that has been mine has spanned over two decades, I was like, I don't want to get stuck somewhere else. I've actually had commitment phobia. And they were like, yeah, I've been here for 10 years. I've been here for 19 years. I was like, why? And obviously all of them had not started like where they were. They'd all moved around, but it was the culture. Um, and so that speaks volumes to the business but they embrace you know they love to have athletes come in I share my story frequently with the business um and yeah they really respect what athletes um bring to the table but also they pay us <laughs> like they respect it as well because I had a, you know interviewed for a few jobs and you know might have got the offer but the, the pay was also a bit of a disrespect so yeah that's what I do a lot I'm still got one foot firmly in the sports world um huge advocate for supporting athletes through this this transition which happens not just at the end of your career I think we're constantly going through transitions so I love to talk about branding and lifestyle and just things to think about that I hadn't really thought about to be honest and wish I had someone mentoring me and saying you know prepare for this financial literacy in fact one of the people I'm obsessed with following Eman <laughs> I, I, got, I learned through you yeah because E-man. he you know inspires me so much he's talking about financial um investments and literacy and you know I didn't have this as an athlete and so you know I've messaged him already I was like we need to connect because you need to support athletes <laughs> um <laughs> so I'm still on a journey I'm still evolving but I'm really happy to really use a lot of the tools and a lot of the experiences and successes and the platform that sport has given me in my next phase, uh, what that looks like. And yeah, just continue to, to champion excellence and self-development and yeah, just be it, be that kind of beacon of hope or light or that voice wherever I can. So yeah, that's just a bit of what I'm up to 
about now. <laughs> I, I, I love it. Listen, Marilyn, you're dope. Um, I, I really like what you do. I really hope that our listeners have a real idea of the, this, this podcast is about journeys and I mm. hope that they've got an idea of the journey. It started with um, education and a talent, but you've navigated um, so much crap, um, lack of support, um, you know, body image uh, abuse, I, I, I would call it, um, colorism, we didn't even really get into that. Um, and you've you've come through to be an Olympian, but 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 more than that, someone that now really is ensuring that your worth is something you're gonna you're gonna stand firm with and try and project onto other people to understand what their worth is as well. And 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 I, and I really rate that as well. Um, yeah, I, I I I love that. I love that. And your energy, you. is, like, your energy is just one hundred, man. I'm 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 so for it. Um, and I'm blessed to have you on the podcast. So thank you very much. Oh, it takes one to know one, Jordan. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed. This literally made the highlight of my, my day. So oh, I really appreciate yeah. you. Um, and yeah, I mean, each one teach one, right? So it's just, it's just a privilege. I actually accept this privilege. And yeah, just, you know, I'm, I'm that person. Anyone that needs support, reach out. And if I can't do it, I will definitely connect to you. Your network is your net worth. And I just love to network. So. <laughs> 100%, 100%. Listen, Marilyn, big up yourself and take care. So thank you very much for coming on. Thank you.